but we need to still keep ourselves safe. So I'm delighted to um, invite Dr. Mohamed Kamara um, to tell us about um, COVID variants, especially the variants, do the, the variants are the symptoms different to what we knew as original COVID, if you can call it that, um, and how to manage the symptoms and not be too worried, especially if children are getting it. So I'm going to hand over to Dr. Kamara now. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. I'm just uh, struggling with opening this this presentation. Let me see. Uh, uh, now he's doing it. So how's everybody? <clears throat> I okay. Yeah, well, that's good. Thank you so much for having me. And now, one thing I would, I, I I don't know whether that's okay with yourselves or not, is actually to just. Uh, possibly find out from the um, at the audience or the number of people that have attended who's had the vaccine and who hasn't. And, and that way, it'd be nice to see what impact you make at the end in terms of who you've managed to convince and who it is that is uh, probably still undecided. So if you're happy with that, then maybe, I don't know, Charles or whoever's there can do it. Just a show of hands, maybe. Yeah, I think the easiest way to do this would be there is a function uh, on your Zoom. If you're happy to, it says reactions. And if you have had it, if you can, in the reaction, just raise hand or show a thumbs up, some kind of comment. So I, I'm going to put thumbs up. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> so for, for the people that are here, um, there are a few that are happy to, I'm sure there'll be some that are not happy to share whether they've had it or not. Yeah, that's okay, that's that okay. <laughs> um, but there's quite a few, at least more than a third. That's good, equally, equally fine. I mean, if you don't want to share that, all right. I mean, the key thing is we have an idea as to what we're dealing with in terms of uh, whether we still stuck where we are or whether we're making progress. That's what the essence is of conducting such a survey. I suppose the numbers will suggest that we're making progress. Yeah. Not, not maybe the, I mean, the best progress will be everybody to be vaccinated and Absolutely. everybody hasn't <laughs> yeah. been yet. Yeah, I could agree more. Right. Okay. So let's see. Come on now. Right, here we go. Technology, eh? <laughs> when you need it. <laughs> right. Come on now. Anyway. Just before you start, Mohammed, um, yeah. I know you're going to invite um, someone to speak, someone who's been um, affected with long yeah, COVID. Yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a someone who uh, is, uh, I think she's called, um, was it? She actually, um, there's a lady that would like to share her, her story of um, uh, COVID and the fact that she's definitely um, struggling with long COVID. And um, she'll be speaking around 11.45, something like that. Um, no unless we finish quicker or earlier. And then see how it goes from there. But she would be doing it um, without the camera. That's uh, fine. I think, yeah, I think. So I'd just like to it. say thank you to, um, and I think it's really helpful to have, I mean, it's nice, and I really value colleagues who are here today listening and our medical colleagues who tell us their experiences and um, some information, share information about all these medical conditions. But what's really instructive is hearing it from a patient perspective really, somebody who's been through it. I find that much more powerful um, in some instances and they <clears throat> really give you the whole picture. So I think it's really important that we understand for ourselves, but hearing it from somebody who's been affected, I think would be really helpful. So um, you haven't told us her name, but um, whoever you are, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm looking forward to hearing that se section of the talk. Yeah, I mean, I say, there's no, no powerful 
um, testimony, as you say, uh, than a lived experience, someone who's been through it. You know, as I, I think I heard someone tell me, who feels it knows it. If you've never felt it, you would never know what it is about. Anyway, this is me and uh, let's hope I can get this thing going. I always start with an icebreaker. Again, to the audience without Ngozi. <laughs> Can anybody tell me what this is? Who knows what this is? You can, I don't know, you can unmute them and see whether they know what it is or not. Someone okay. said, we've got an answer here, a tap. No, it's not a tap. Ah, that's good, I like that. <laughs> Why is it a tap? <laughs> that is definitely not a tap. Yeah, but it's important that you don't come across this because if you come across this, uh, you're not very well, I can tell you that. Uh, this is why not many people know about it. And even amongst the, uh, the health professionals, only if you work in that area where they use it, you won't be able to recognize it. But this is, <clears throat> as it says down there, say at home and you will be able to find out. But this is a Macintosh laryngoscope. It's a, a, a kind of an instrument you use to actually expose the cords of the voice box where the tube goes into uh, for you to be able to uh, be put connected to the ventilator, the machine that would help you breathe when you have a very heavy dose of um, COVID-19 to the extent where you can't breathe on your own. So that's what that instrument does. It is just something to help people to understand the magnitude and the severity of this uh, monster that we're facing. Uh, this is just an introduction. I think we all know about this, that this was first recognized in China in 2019. Uh, there are four types in that family, the alpha, the beta, the gamma, and the delta. The alpha one we come across and we've known for a long time, which gives you or produces this flu that we always have seasonally every year. The beta one is the one that we're dealing with. This is the one that gives you the SARS. And it's just not one. Uh, there's been a few of them. And as I say, the coronavirus itself, <clears throat> excuse me, there's seven. So people think this is not the first one, but it isn't. You know, there are you know, the ones that we maybe remember, the MERS, the ones people get uh, when they come from Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the Middle East, maybe they went for pilgrimage for Hajj or Umrah, uh, maybe Dubai for, you know, holidays and then came back and they're unwell, you know, having the sore throat, the temperature and things. Now, people know about this, but that's all the coronaviruses we know. Now, we talked about the um, variants. Now, this is not exhaustive by any means, there's about, believe it or not, 13 variants, 13, yeah? Including the, the Delta one that we're talking about, and of course, uh, the one, the so-called Indian one without wanting to be racist. Uh, but there you go, you got the, one thing they have is they're very, very easy and fastly transferred from one to another. Now people ask me, uh, is this man-made or not? Now I can tell you, there have been things like bird flu, you know, swine flu. So they definitely come from animal. The unfortunate thing is, I don't think we did realize at the time that this will come from animal and then it will then develop that characteristic of going from, from animal to human and then from human to human. And that's where this is. So it's like uh, it created that business where it was a, a conundrum. You know, how does it come from animal to human being, but not the other way around? And now you have human to human transmission. So as you can see, there's 13 variants, as I can say. And so it's difficult for anyone to say, well, I can do without the vaccine. Perhaps you can be lucky against one, two, five, but the chances of being lucky against 13 variants is quite slim. So it would be advisable or logic dictates that maybe uh, the best thing to do is when your turn comes and you are invited, go get the job. That is the, you know, the, the safest thing you can do and that's the most sensible thing you can do. So as you can see, uh, these are all the areas where you have them, even, you know, even in, in Nigeria, South Africa, you know, uh, in America, you have three variants. In Brazil, you've got two variants. In Germany, there's another variant. So there's all over the world different. And that's the, 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 the unique uh, characteristic of a coronavirus, you know, the RMA, you know, the RNA virus, which is this, I mean, everybody talked about HIV and HIV is also an RNA virus. So one thing they have is they mutate, they change. 
So if they're like wearing green today, they might wear green, uh, blue tomorrow, maybe white tomorrow. And each and every time that happens, you have to stay at the race. You stay with them neck to neck and maybe try and surpass them. That is the only way you can actually outwit this monster. Very clever. So it changes. And as it changes, that's how you need to be changing your stance and your approach, you know? So we talk about <clears throat> um, the, the, the COVID itself, but if you look at it, it's very, very similar to other illnesses. And that's the interesting thing about it, because you've got people who suffer with colds, which we know we all do, you can see, and people who have the flu and people who have allergic reactions or maybe allergies like hay fever. And then of course the COVID, you can see how uh, the, the symptoms like fever, headache, aches and pains, fatigue, weakness, exhaustion, uh, stuffy nose and runny nose, sneezing and a sore throat. You can see how they have them in common, but uh, how the, some, some of them are rare, but then in actual fact, when you look at the COVID itself, you can see that fever is common, headache can be present, and, you know, uh, and of course, aches and pains can be present, fatigue can be present, uh, extreme exhaustion can be present, uh, snuffy nose and, uh, you know, and, and, and runny nose can be present, and sneezing has been reported, and of course, the sore throat we know, and of course, the loss of smell uh, has been reported. But when you look at the other ones, you can see that in someone who's got an allergy, fever is never present. Headache is very uncommon. Uh, the aches and pains you never get with an allergy because there's nothing that it's all on the skin or in the chest, depending on what it is. And sometimes you can get tired because you obviously you're finding it difficult to breathe. And so you blow out and you get a lot more problems with uh, steadiness, you know. And of course, you never get exhausted with, a, with an allergy, you know, but you get a runny nose and a stuffy nose and you can sneeze, of course, you know, that's what you get normally with it. And sometimes you can get a sore throat because the coughing and sneezing can cause that. You see, the flu, you can see temperature can be really high for days. Uh, headache can be very intense with the flu. Um, aches and pains, that's typical of it. You know, you get the joint pain and aches and you can't even get yourself out of bed. Uh, it can last up to two, two, three weeks. You know, it starts very early. And of course, the runny nose, we know you can get that. Sneezing you get. And of course, a common sore throat, that's with the flu. The cold, as you can see, most of them are rare. The only thing they have in common is, is a stuffy nose and of course the sore throat. So we looked at <clears throat> all of those symptoms, but then there are some that are, you know, very uh, rare and sometimes less common. You can see um, the diarrhea can be part of that conjunctivitis, that's the inflammation of the, the eye, uh, the white of the eye. And then of course, uh, rash on the skin, you know, uh, and on the fingers and sometimes on the toes. It's like a bluish rash which obviously uh, can be indicative of, of, of the COVID-19 infection. Um, chest pain or pressure in the, in the chest uh, can definitely be associated with that. And until it's proved otherwise, in someone who's got shortness of breath, I would want to get them tested and see where we go. Um, very, very rare, they've reported loss of speech and movement. So it's like a stroke kind of thing. And this picture here typifies what the tongue looks like uh, in one of these um, this, uh, th these situations where it affects the, uh, the, the, the tongue, as it were. So I thought I'd show you this <clears throat> just for, see the, for, you, for you to see and get a, an understanding as to what happens to the chest. This is an x-ray of the chest, as you can see, the left one and the right one. If you look at the left here, you would see for yourself where the arrows are. That's how the COVID affects the chest. It creates what we call ground glass appearance. If you are able to pulverize you know, the glass, that's what you would look, that's what you would see. You know, when it gets better, this is what it looks like. As you can see, the white bit here is the heart. You know, the white lines you can see here, those are the ribs. And that black bit you can see there, that's the lung on the right, and that's the lung on the left, yeah? That on the right, the left there is the collarbone, and that on the right there is the collarbone. Uh, but then you can look at this picture and compare it to that. Certainly you can see that this is a lot better than that because this looks like snowstorm to me. You know, when you look at it, it, there's nothing there and it has to be black for you to be able to breathe. So everything that has got air 
in a chest x-ray is black and you can see all the white there indicates that this person was in trouble difficulty breathing and of course in doing so it can actually cause the lung to collapse and you can see that bit where the arrows are you can see the picture there it's not the same as that there's no marking on this part where there's a, the markings there so this is the only part of the lung that is okay all this bit is collapsed and this person will be struggling to breathe as you can see there's a tube there which shows you that this person was really struggling they were in a bad way and that needed a drain you know we go into the chest and release the air because the air is trapped in there and believe you or not after two weeks or so this is what it looks like when you compare this one to this you would see the difference you know yeah so it's not a joke it is very very serious and this can really kill as we know already uh, come on now, move. All right, here we go. I was going to show you a video, but if there is time, then maybe we can go into that if you want to. Um, <clears throat> but it's not, in fact, I'll tell you what, let's do it. The only trouble is whether I'll be able to play it or not. No, it's not playing. It's a very good video, but would it play? Never mind. Okay, we'll sort that later. So now, of course, when 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 you've had a dose of the COVID, you must remember that we have uh, two to three percent mortality. So out of maybe a hundred people, you have two or three that may really have it badly, and as a result, might end up uh, you know paying with their lives. But of those who survive, uh, one in every five people have signs and symptoms that may last up to five weeks. And when that happens, this is the Office of National Statistics. That's not me making it up. So when this happens and you have them, the symptoms lasting up to five weeks, it is now not, you know, uh, COVID in, on its own. It's called longer COVID. So, you know, and sometimes they can last up to 12 weeks and sometimes they're even longer. You know, nobody can tell you exactly how long it is. However, if someone has had the symptoms longer than five weeks, then that person is now classed as having had uh, long COVID or having long COVID. Now, I just wanted to share a timeline of uh, somebody, I don't want to name the name, but you can see uh, that this person is a colleague and they allowed me to actually anonymize it and just tell you how things are because they, it's important to you know, share the message, the experience for you to see that even us doctors are not immune. In fact, we're the ones that are very, that are very, very exposed and very, very uh, susceptible and prone to catching this because of the work we do, because of where we are. So this person that I'm talking about on the 20th of May, uh, that's when he thought he got exposed, high risk of exposure to this virus when he was working in the department, you know, in the intensive care. And he didn't take note of it because he wasn't aware that he's contracted it and as you know it takes 14 days to brew as they say you know the incubation period can last up to 14 days and true to form on the 2nd of june this is like maybe 13 days later uh, that is day zero when she definitely felt unwell and by the fifth definitely when they did the test it was confirmed that yes it is so she really struggled. She was on her own, you know, tried to do what she could do in terms of taking paracetamol, ibuprofen, uh, watching uh, her saturations and watching uh, breathing and all that. And then uh, realized that, hang on, to, up to the 10th, she could bear it. By the 11th, she couldn't. And then, of course, she knew that she had to call 111, which indeed she did. And she was brought to the hospital. And I was there to look after him. And um, uh, on the 11th and the same day, he was really unwell. And so uh, we had no option but to admit him. Because sometimes people can come in not very unwell, uh, but then you treat them there and then you send them back home with uh, continuing treatment and observation with a view to uh, reattending or maybe you know, representing if the symptoms uh, do not respond or uh, and the person gets worse. So as it is, he was in such a state that there's no chance he could have survived at home on his own. And therefore we had to admit him. And of course, when we admitted him, 
it, it didn't take any much of rock science that look rocket science this is definitely something that this person is gonna you know maybe uh, be so unwell that we, we, there is a very high chance of losing him and therefore we admitted him on the intensive care unit now on the intensive care unit a lot of people think when you go there because that's what they worry about they go oops once you go there you don't come out not the case they would go there to keep an eye on you to give you the necessary treatment they will start with a high flow oxygen and then maybe go on to what we call CPAP. It's like, a, if you imagine you're on the motorway doing a 70 mile an hour and you wind the glass down, you know, the, that glass and you put your head out and the, the wind on your face, that's what it feels like. You know, that 70 miles an hour and that wind on your face with the glass down on the motorway is what that mask feels like. So it's very uncomfortable. Most people don't tolerate it. And you have to have certain, um, level of consciousness for you to be able to tolerate it. If you're really in a bad way, you would not be put on that. You would then be needing that particular, uh, th that instrument that we showed you at the very beginning, the laryngoscope, where you'd be put to sleep in order to allow the lungs to sort of remedy themselves, to get well, get better with a view to being able to, you know, um, control your breathing and, you know, maintain your own airway. So as it is, luckily for her, or him, sorry, luckily for him, um, we didn't get to that point where we needed to intubate, i.e. to put them on the ventilator, but they still needed the, the CPAP, you know, that mask. And that continued on till the 13th when he showed signs of uh, improvement, you know, with all the necessary treatment, the antibiotics, the steroids, and, and the, the, blood, uh, uh, the, the blood thinning agents that we gave uh, and anti-inflammatories that we gave, and of course the uh, the misting uh, uh, medicines we call the nebulizers, all of that was put into her. And of course, he. So why would I keep saying her? It's him actually. Um, um, and, and then of course uh, he improved to the point where he then got um, um, sort of de-escalated, if you like, uh, to the high dependency unit. But that does not necessarily mean that they're out of the water. Um, they're still seriously ill, but they're not as bad as to be on that unit where they will need uh, the, the tubing. Uh, again, a day later, you no, know, he got better and then got, you know, stepped down to the respiratory ward where most of the COVID patients are and improving. And of course, uh, by the 22nd, which is like eight days later, which is day 21, Holmes went home. Now he was very pleased that he had got home but then therein lies the mystery, because thinking that I have gone through that, that's it, I'm fine. But I tell you what, that was just the beginning. Now, long COVID has got symptoms, and this is not by any means exhaustive. I've, I've talked about some of them already. Uh, so far, I think there is over 150 and counting. There's a few more that we don't know about. Maybe they'll reveal themselves as we go on. But you can see it's a multi system you know, infection and illness, it affects from head to toe. It can cause seizures, problems with the nerves, hair loss, like someone who's having chemotherapy. Obviously it can cause bruising, lumps. The heart rate can go very fast. It can cause uh, problems with the heart, myocarditis, as you can see. Of course, we know by the shortness of breath, the coughing, the chest pains, and sometimes it can mimic uh, embolus, like a blood clot in the, in the, in the chest. It affects the smell the taste and of course ringing of the ears and of course a lot of people don't know this but it causes problems with the menstrual cycle yeah some can be longer some can be uh, shorter they can bleed a lot more it causes obviously muscle and back pain and most importantly it causes brain fog now is this brain fog that this chap could not cope with because he's a very clever chap and obviously when this happened after he got discharged he then could not you know come to terms with this and that developed into anxiety and he further developed sadly depression so he needed some support big time it just goes to show you so the commonest symptom they actually cite when they do go home the ones that suffer with this long COVID is fatigue I think uh, people can bear me witness so when you hear from the lady you might uh, prove me right that fatigue is the commonest symptom they cite that's followed by the shortness of breath and of course the chest pain and you can see that and believe it or not, sometimes you get this dry syndrome, they call it seeker syndrome, where the eyes dry, the lips and the mouth can dry, and that can cause problems as well. 
you know, uh, the lack of appetite. Sometimes you have the head spinning, vertigo, you know, and sometimes, believe it or not, there is diarrhea. So this is what you can see. It's a very busy slide, but it goes to show you, as I said, 150 and counting. Yeah. <clears throat> so I just thought, you know, the types of vaccines, I think we know about them. The our very own um, AstraZeneca, AZ, the Moderna, which is American, and of course the Pfizer, German American, and the Gamalaya Sputnik, which is the Russian. You can see that one thing they have in common is that they all do have two injections, two vaccines each. Um, the cost is also something to look at in terms of uh, the cheapest one being the UK one, which is like four dollars or three quid. Uh, and the most expensive, obviously, is <clears throat> the American one, which is not surprising. However, uh, when you look at them in terms of logistics, in terms of um, viability, uh, not efficacy, I want to repeat, uh, viability, because you know if you can use it at fridge temperature, where you can put it in the fridge, the GPs and the other allied professionals can go into people's houses and inject it, and that makes it a lot better. Plus, you can keep it for like a month. Whereas when you look at uh, the ones that you store at minus 70 and minus 20, the Moderna and the Pfizer, you then have to thaw it. You need to bring it to the level, to this, you know, the, the temperature that you know it's, you know, fit for human consumption. And by doing so, you then have a limited period of time to use it. So in some cases, five days, and thereafter, the rest of it is not, not, not viable and not, you know, uh, uh, useful or beneficial. Therefore, it has to be thrown away. So it makes you wonder, you know, where that lies. I mean, in terms of efficacy, uh, they say the AstraZeneca one is the least because it ranges between 62 and 90. However, the advantage is it's cheaper, but that at the same time, it can be used um, at fridge, you know, it can be stored at the fridge and of course, uh, can be used at uh, room temperature. Um, and of course, we know about the side effects we talk about, but that we'll talk about later. But it just goes to show you that there are issues related with logistics of, uh, you know, uh, storage, transportation, and of course, uh, financial constraints. So there are two more that you can see. Uh, it, amongst them, the only one which has one injection is the Johnson & Johnson, you know. But one thing all these six would have, and there are some that are still being brought, you know, been developed, you could see that all of them do have 100%, you know, um, efficacy in terms of avoiding uh, hospitalizations for the severest form of the disease and, of course, death. So that's one thing you have to bear in mind, that if for nothing at all, this vaccine is not a cure. It's not curative at all. I want people to understand that. It is preventative. It prevents you contracting or maybe, you know, catching the illness. And even then, it is the severest form of it because you could still have it. And uh, because of the vaccine in you, it would not be that bad. It wouldn't be severe. So you would not even know about it, but yet you can pass it on to somebody else. So that, that's the thing that needs to be established that this is preventative of the severest form of the illness where you'd be needing to be put to a ventilator. That is what it prevents. And of course it prevents the death from that. So <clears throat> uh, you can see the vaccines and you know how they are and what they do. Uh, some of them are viral vector, some of them uh, antigen presenting cells, uh, virus-like particles, protein subunits, and you know all of that you can see. Uh, I think this is a bit outdated because you can see that we're way above that. We're up to 75%, uh, I think, of adults in the UK. Uh, this was when I did the talk um, a few months ago. But you can see that one thing that we actually do the vaccination for is to uh, achieve what we call herd immunity against the COVID-19. And this is only achievable uh, with a potent vaccine. Uh, but of course, because of the hesitancy, uh, we're worried that or we're concerned that this might not be achieved. Uh, but remember that in 1918, just over 100 years ago, there were three spikes uh, of this um, monster. Um, and of course, it ended in 55 million people dying, uh, losing their lives out of 500 million people that contracted it. And it took two years. So, you know, 
we need to be mindful of that. So this is what that was that at the time. It's definitely a lot better now. Uh, there's over 127,000 deaths, as we know, but over 40% of the adult population have had their first one. So I thought, you know, talking about long COVID, you need to know what happens to somebody who they say had the COVID, was there for a long, long time, maybe on the ITU or the respiratory ward, and, um, you know, ended up being diagnosed with long COVID. When they go home, this is what they go home with. Uh, or where they go home, what happens to them. Uh, they sometimes go home with steroids, you know, for a 10 days full course. Uh, they're then given prophylactic low molecular weight heparin for four weeks. You know, that is dependent on the clinician or the doctor or any other specialist who is treating the patient. But they're given prophylaxis because uh, uh, they want to prevent, uh, you know, the clots forming in the, in, the, in the lung and thereby causing problems for them to breathe. Um, they then organize uh, secondary care uh, as a follow-up as per the British Thoracic Society's guidelines. Uh, there's, a phone, there's a phone call that you get, which is virtual, you know, uh, and that's after six weeks now. Believe you me, there has been problems achieving this target. You know, the GPs will tell you they've not been able, not even half of them have been contacted. And there's delays, you know, worse still, uh, six, uh, 12 weeks after you've had uh, the first x-ray and being discharged, you'd expect to have had or maybe being invited for a CT scan of your chest or your thorax, and of course the lung function to be performed. But I tell you what, we're lagging definitely big time on achieving this really. And then of course thereafter, you then end up with a face-to-face -face follow up uh, for severe COVID where you've had uh, the, the CPAP as I mentioned and whether you've been on the ITU, you should definitely have that. But as I say, we're struggling to achieve that. So after the first three weeks, how do you manage that, the, the, the long COVID? Well, approximately 10% of the people, as I say, experience prolonged illness after this COVID. Uh, they recover, most of them do recover spontaneously um, with holistic support, uh, rest, symptomatic treatment and gradually increasing their activity. Uh, they obviously need to be monitoring their oxygen levels, you know, and then the, the breathlessness they do have. If it's worsening, then obviously they need to be reviewed with a view to either readmission or maybe a specialist sent to them to get them uh, on the road to uh, recovery. Um, <clears throat> but then, what you can do is obviously try and eat well, try and sleep well. That is a big ask for some people because that's one thing, you know, not eating well, the appetite is obviously impaired and therefore it creates a bit of a problem. You know, get moving again, that's the important thing, stay active. You know, I know that people get breathless, people get tired, people get fatigued easily, but then you have to be, you know, uh, if you like, stubborn. In, in this case, you need to be stubborn, you need to be, uh, committed and determined to actually uh, beat this. And that's the only way you can get, you know, yourself improving because the more you challenge yourself, but don't overdo it, the better it is for you. And then of course, uh, remember that's the big thing, maintaining your mental health. That is something that would cause a lot of problems in the future. There's no two ways about it. The um, domestic violence rate has gone up you know, the sexual molestation rate had gone up, you know, the anxieties, the depression, the suicide rates, all of that have gone up. So definitely uh, that is on the rise and we need to be mindful of that really. So this is just uh, ideas for nourishing meals that you may have, uh, you know, cottage cheese and things, fish, chicken, curry and rice, prawn, chicken noodles, all of that, you know, for you to get, you know, extra energy and protein into your food, there's peanut, there's peanut butter, cashew nut butter, almonds and all that. Uh, chickpea you can use, you can use plain yogurt. Uh, and of course you could get the skim milk, which you can use grated cheese, uh, add to mashed potato with scrambled egg and soup. So all of that, uh, you people know better than me, you know, there's dal with naan, egg omelette and potatoes. These are all rich in protein, hummus, crackers, they help uh, to improve uh, your, 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 your immune system and of course your coping mechanisms, you know. 
But then, as I say, sleep well, it's really good. But in doing so, remember that you have to have your time for bed, your time to sleep. And during sleep time, remember, do not clock watch, you know, keep to a regular time that you, you know, you want to go to bed and times that you want to wake up. Develop this bedtime ritual that you know that you have to prepare, you know, for sleep. And when you go to sleep, don't put the TV on thinking that, oh, go, you know, I can maybe catch a, a movie here or there, or maybe a soap. Doesn't work. And avoid, avoid caffeine, nicotine, the smoking, and of course the alcohol before you go to bed. That wouldn't help you. You know, avoid heavy meals within two hours of bedtime. So if you have to eat maybe three to four hours before then, reduce the light and the temperature and the noise in the room and keep the bedroom for sleeping and intimacy only. It's not for you to go there and start, you know, clock watching, definitely. Uh, if you're awake for more than 20 minutes, then perhaps get out of bed, try and unwind. And then when you're feeling tired again, then return to bed, you know. Uh, as I was saying earlier, avoid energetic exercises within two hours of bedtime. Some people think when they exercise before bedtime, that's when they can sleep. It doesn't work like that. All you do is you stimulate the body and then you struggle with your sleep. You know, if you want to, you can wind down, you know, by reading and listening to some music before you go up, you know, banish the screens, as we just said, from the bedroom, you know, the iPads, the mobiles and all that. Uh, but if you can't sleep, do not worry. Uh, the more you worry, the more obviously you're likely to stay awake. So it's like a vicious circle, you know, try and get up, do something else, get unwound, and then, you know, get a bit more tired and then you can definitely sleep. So as we said, get moving again, regular physical activity, you know, start slowly. Remember, starting slowly is the key. Don't overdo it because if you overdo it, you set yourself back, you might not be able to garner that or pluck up the courage to start, to start again. And that creates a bit of a problem. And once that is knocked, that confidence, it then you know knocks you back to the point whereby you might not even be able to do that. And therein lies the danger when the depression sets in, you know, the feeling that you are now a burden to someone. Ugh, it just sets in and that creates a bit of a problem. So therefore, be gradual, slowly build it up, you know, reduce the time or the amount of time you use sitting down. Aim for a walk daily, even if it's just a meter away, 10 meters away, 20 meters away, just round the, the block or maybe the garden, that would be better than just sitting down. You know, uh, be kind to yourself. If you're having a bad day, remember, you know, it's normal to have setbacks, but don't give up. We do have that as well. You know, we get bad days, but we don't give up. We, we sort of, you know, recharge the batteries and come back. You know, remember, it's a good thing to connect with people, you know, reach out to family members and friends. They are, you know, helpful in such situations, you know. Uh, having a daily routine uh, is very good. It's recommended for your mood and your sense of stability, you know, but above all, stay active, continuing to move uh, will help you release what we call the endorphins. You know, these are substances in the body uh, that help you to, it's like we call them the glad rags. They help you to improve your, move, uh, your mood. And, and that is quite good because the more you summon for them to come, the better it is for you. If you've got fatigue and breathlessness, then, you know, pace yourself, you know, break the tasks into smaller chunks so that you can achieve them. And the more you achieve them, the more confident you are to go further and further until you can achieve your PB, your personal best. Uh, decide what the best time to do the activities, whether it's first thing in the morning or during the day, midday, or maybe later on. You know, if you live in the places where it's very hot, perhaps the, the sunshine might not be very good for you. But then when it's a bit cooler, you can go out. You know, frequent short rests are better than the long ones, if that's what you can afford. You know, even when you're breathless, be persistent. That is the only way you can overcome that. You know, the muscles, the longer you don't use them, the weaker they get. So the more you use them, they, they have what they call myokines. And myokines in the, in the muscles you can only get when you move them, when you work with them. And they are very good because they help you uh, with your immune system. They boost the immune system. And that's why it is important to gradually increase your exercise limit. So, but of course we have uncertainties, you know, um, working out what triggers the relapses of the fatigue is very unclear. Uh, the fear of reinfection, that's what most people talk about. Can I get it again? And if I do get it, 
what would happen to me? Would I be able to survive this time or not? Uh, someone who used to go to work on a daily basis is now looking at things, oh, for God's sake, how am I going to go to work? Six months down the line, I haven't been to my place of work. When do you decide you're fit to go to work? You know, um, am I protected against this new variant or not? You know, there are what we call long-term neurocognitive and cardiovascular effects, the ones that have got to do with the brain and the memory, and of course, with the heart. You know, some people, as I said, are, are, are waiting uh, a chest x-ray and a CT scan. And that increases the anxiety because they're not quite sure what will be found or what could be uh, they are waiting for them to come to terms with. So all of that adds to this uncertainty. You know, uh, when they um, when they try and um, look at the job plan, what you've been doing when you were well, compared to how you are now unwell, can you actually do what it is that you were doing? All of this is definitely not helpful to the individual and therefore it needs to be dealt with in a very delicate way, in a very sensitive way, you know. But we have to be sensitive, we have to be, um, you know, empathetic, dealing with, you know, colleagues, dealing with friends, family members, you know, and educating all the, the other people, you know, fear of being perceived as a shirker is another thing. Well, how long does it take to recover? A lot of people will be asking me that, and unfortunately, there's no current way of determining or predicting how long that will take. I know for sure. I think I read something in the Daily Mail yesterday that up to one year uh, now, as we're speaking, some people are still struggling. You know, uh, I think it's up to a million people that have got this and they're struggling in the UK, from what I gather. Yeah. <clears throat> it is important to note that this isn't unique to just the COVID-19. There are other viral illnesses that also have very lasting effects. You know, uh, it's not contagious, you must remember. Yeah, long COVID, not, not COVID-19, long COVID itself is not contagious. Uh, they're caused by the body's response to the virus continuing beyond, beyond the, the, the original illness. So once you've you know, recovered from the threatening symptoms with your chest, your heart, uh, you then have this, but it's not something you would pass on. So long COVID is not something you pass on to somebody else. What should I do? Somebody asked me uh, if I think I have long COVID. Well, avoid passing <laughs> coronavirus onto others. Following the guidelines is very important. But they have three Ps, which the NHS recommends. You pace yourself, don't push yourself too hard. You need to have plenty of rest. And of course, plan your day so that your most tiring activities are spread out across the week. Instead of all cramming them up in one day, uh, you could actually do them in three days, which is no mean feat. You know, and of course, prioritize, you know, think about what you need most and, you know, what can be put off. Uh, and that way you can actually, you know, prioritize. So what you need to understand is you need to recognize that indeed long COVID exists. There's no questions about that. Dealing with uncertainty is a new illness. Of a, of a new illness as we find it is definitely very hard. It's difficult, you know, coming to terms with it. There's no questions about that. Uh, remember, people are talking about all sorts of things and there is always the risk of information overload. And uh, there is what we call primary, secondary and tertiary prevention. For that, uh, you need to probably contact your GPs and they would actually be in a better position to tell you about them. Um, remember, as we talked about it, uh, we've got someone who can tell us a bit about how things are, but the one who's had the lived experience, someone who's actually gone through it is the best person to learn from. And you don't have to suffer in silence. Surround yourself with positive people, you know, manage your expectations, you know, lots of fluids, avoid alcohol, um, the supplements, advice on doctors, you know, for, from doctors you need definitely. And of course, remember your exercises, you need to be able to manage. If it's beyond your scope, then divide it, you know, measure it, and remember to be talking to your GPs. But most of all, stick to the government guidelines. I think I'll stop so far, but these are my references. So let's talk and let's get questions and answers. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you so much. Um, there are quite a number of, of questions, but I wonder whether this is the time for Andrea, if Andrea yeah. would like to um, share her story. Yeah, it'd be good. Experience. Be good, definitely. Yeah. Yes. Is that okay, Andrea? Are you here? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Thank you so much for coming. 
Yeah, thank you very the, much for having me. Thank you very much for having all, me. Not mention at all, because as Mohammed has said, really, this is for me that this is what squares a circle. It's all well and good us talking about symptoms, but for someone to bring it to life, it's really impactful. So thank you for sharing your story today. Thank you very much for having me, as I said before. Um, from what Dr. Mohammed said, he has actually said it all. It's really real, most of the information that he has passed on to, to us. And I must say good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And I am Andrea. I work within the health sector. I caught COVID in April, 2020. At the beginning, um, symptoms that I had were, were headaches, high temperature, and constant dry coughing. I also have underlying conditions. For months, it really had developed into different, different areas as um, con constant cough for about eight months, constant cough has been going, had been going on and breathing problem, um, constant breathing problem. Can't lie, can't sleep. I had to, my doctor had advised me to lie on my stomach most of the time, you know, that is uncomfortable. Strong fatigue in my hands for months, especially my hands in my feet, and it, it, it um, pains in my feet, in my lower area, very weak. Um, smell, um, it had great, had great effect um, with, with tasting and smelling. But presently, um, after so what, one year, two months, a, a month now, I am coming getting on. Um, my main problem is fatigue, fatigue in my lower area. I am fully vaccinated now. I'm getting stronger physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, emotionally by God's help. help. COVID is, is a real virus because it has affected me. I am always been a workaholic, but no, my mobility has really reduced. I encourage you ladies and gentlemen to take care of yourselves in every area and ensure that you take your vaccine. It is better to be safe than sorry. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Andrea. That was, thank you, just, just thank you for sharing your story. It's very moving to hear from people who have been affected by it. Um, so thanks very much for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. And as Andrea said, better to be safe than sorry. I know the majority of people who have, have um, who have dialed in today are people who um, perhaps have taken the vaccine. There might be people who are still concerned and still worried, but even if you have, there is there are things about long COVID that, you know, as, as we've heard. Um, so there are a number of questions. I'm going to go to the questions now. So one of the questions is, um, do we have any evidence about prevalence of long COVID in black people? Does it seem to be any better or any worse than everybody else? Uh, well, I mean, uh, I don't know whether there's any specific, um, if you like, um, trials or research that has been done uh, just um, relating to just um, the BAME reps uh, with long COVID. I'm not sure there's any uh, data uh, out there. I could be wrong, uh, but as far as I know, there's nothing. What, what they would normally do is obviously long COVID in general, whether it be it Caucasian or BAME and therefore, uh, but whether it's specifically related or maybe uh, aimed at or targeted at the BAME community, I doubt that very much. But if, if I mean, logic dictates that if we're the ones that are 
if you like, disproportionately uh, affected by uh, this monster, as I put it. Uh, now, you know, it's not rocket science to say that we suffer most. And if you look at the underlying conditions as alluded to by Andrea, uh, we're the ones that do not pay much attention to our health. You know, we are the ones that are the lowly paid jobs, you know, we're in the front line. We're the ones that do maybe two or three jobs. We live in the congested houses. I mean, the low strata, the social strata of community and all. So we are worst affected, you know, and of course, vitamin D, you know, at uh, the lower level, the lower end of the spectrum. So, and I could be different, but logic dictates that we definitely would be the worst affected in terms of long, long COVID really. But as I say, the scientific facts may yet reveal otherwise, but it figures that maybe that's where we are really. Um, there are lots of questions about the vaccine as well. Um, so do you think the vaccines, what's your opinion on the vaccines that preventing coronavirus? And also how safe do you think the vaccines are for um, people, the families? There's discussions about extending it to children. Um, and you yourself, because there's been so much misinformation, what are your sources as you yourself for what you feel are um, valued sources of information? So who, who do you go to for your source of information? Which are the valuable outlets? Because we know there's lots of misinformation out there. Yeah, well, but still continue to get it, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> on a daily basis. In fact, uh, only yesterday I was told that one of the nurses not wanting to be uh, spreading whatever, you know, maybe she wants to be anonymous, but if it's in the media, then obviously it's not going to be anonymous. And she got struck off because of this, you know, anti-vaccine uh, uh, vaccine, uh, maneuvers that she's been doing and spreading all sorts of So she got struck off yesterday. Um, but for me, <clears throat> I read a lot, as we know, in, in our profession, we have to be, you know, current and we do a lot of reading. So we're guided by the, you know, JVCI and of course, you know, the WHO. And these are the ones uh, that would actually give the guidelines. And of course, the Department of Health in conjunction with them would send the guidelines on a day. We have, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, the lead in the, the CAG, which is the clinical advice community uh, group, uh, the clinical advice group of my trust. So I am there and I receive, you know, first-hand information from uh, the, the GVIC and of course, uh, uh, the Department of Health. So we look into that and we go with those guidelines. And that is the way we conduct ourselves. And that's what we pass on to, you know, to our people, the ones that listen to us, the ones that we think we need to convince. In terms of the vaccines themselves, as I say, um, I personally took the AstraZeneca one. Um, but obviously, you know, AstraZeneca, as we know, has been found to have this very, very rare um, complication, which is uh, the, the blood clots. Uh, but then when you compare uh, the, 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 the frequency uh, of having developing a blood clot, you stand a, a far higher chance of developing a blood clot if you're on the oral contraceptive pill. And of course, if you are on a plane from here to Dubai or to Australia, the chances of you getting a blood clot in the leg uh, is far higher uh, than if you were taking the AstraZeneca one. But obviously because of that, uh, undesirable, you know, effect on on the the under thirties. There has been a change of the course, so therefore all the under thirties are now uh, being uh, sort of offered the Pfizer one. As we know, this is exactly what we talk about. We 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 the MHRA, which is the, the you know that organization which looks at monitoring the the effects of the vaccine, the short term and the long term, is still continuing to do so. So whenever there is something that you know. Uh, is uh, sort of uh, noticed or observed, they definitely have to take the necessary decision to actually alter uh, the trajectory. And that's exactly what has been done in this case. As I speak to you, there is the research going on for the eligibility uh, of the under 18s, because when they were actually doing the trials of the research for the COVID vaccines, uh, they did not include the under 18s. As we speak, that is ongoing. Uh, in America, I think of recent, they've actually um, given the green light for the 12 to 15 year olds to be vaccinated. Uh, that is the most current guidelines we have. Now in the UK, I'm not sure we've got up to that yet because I haven't received anything so far, but that's what we get. So we are on a, a fluid situation whereby things are dynamic, things are moving on. As we get them, we actually try 
and cascade them, you know, and, 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 and to, to the public and of course to our people for them to recognize what it is. But the, the vaccines are definitely effective in the sense that although we're dealing with the so-called Indian variant, I guarantee you, just cast your eyes back or your mind back to uh, maybe December, January, and you can see the number of people who are dying every day. Now, although there's been a spike, you know, you, you actually got like 5,000 something yesterday, uh, but yet the number of deaths, you, you don't even compare to what it was uh, back in January, February. And that is thanks to the vaccine. And largely, uh, we're grateful for that vaccine. So for me, the more we get the vaccine, the more we get the message out there, the better it is for our people. Because as I say, we are the ones that are indiscriminately affected by this thing. And so the more we protect ourselves, the better it is for our outlook. Okay. And in relation to that, the other thing that is reduced is the number of people on ventilators. Because we that work in hospital, this is incomparable to the wave one and wave two. When you compare the number of people affected with the number of people admitted into hospital on ventilators. So that's gone down as well. So that probably is also and not almost certainly due to the vaccine. The other thing I wanted to say about what to one of these two questions was the first one was about misinformation. So misinformation is, is really difficult, but one of the things that you can do is that you can go to trusted source of information as well and look on. So once you find, when, when someone sends you something that you're not sure about, you find, Google it yourself and see um, there are lots of areas that you can to very, try and verify the information you've been sent. And please don't send it on unless you've verified information, unless you're sure of the source of the information. And secondly, to do with blood clots. I have a friend who every time she takes a flight uh, that is more than a couple of hours, she wears um, TED stockings, and this is to prevent clots. I haven't seen anybody doing that, uh, lots of people doing that. And yet, as Dr. Kamara said, the risk of you doing a long flight is much more than the COVID uh, of, a, of a clot, is much more than the risk from a COVID vaccine. So he's trying to put the risks in perspective, really. Um, there's some more questions. So one of the questions is that, um, really sorry to hear this. Uh, this is um, somebody's daughter who is 16, had COVID back in January and still hasn't got her taste back. Any advice? Uh, <laughs> Well, I mean, they have the, the uh, ear, nose and throat specialists for that, or maybe you have the maxillofacial who deal with the mouth and, uh, and uh, they would probably, but this is, this is something I don't think it's permanent. I think uh, it's something that would come. I mean, my daughter contracted it and uh, for like four months, five months, she didn't have a smell, but now she can smell perfume and the extreme end of the spectrum, you know, uh, the bad smell she can smell, the, the good smell she can smell, but in between she's struggling. Uh, but it's far better than when she when she got it in in, in January. So I, I can't say for certain when that will return, but it's a gradual process. If you're concerned in any way, my advice would be to contact your GP and the GP can actually signpost you to the specialist who would probably then look into that really and see how it goes from there. But I can only wish you well. I think it's not a permanent thing. I think it's a gradual thing, but it will come back. But if you're concerned, then maybe uh, check with the GP and they would then signpost you to where uh, you should go. I hope that's clear. Thank you for that. Um, and I think that that's another um, point as well, that as more and more of the adult population get vaccinated, then we know that um, schools are still, um, because there are lots of people in schools and the children in schools, that this is where the number of infected people are going up now. So a couple of weeks ago, my daughter wasn't feeling well, she had a headache. And she took it upon herself. I think she just finished her exams. So I thought it was just um, because of exams, but she did a test and it, it was positive. Um, and then she found out that lots of girls in her school were positive as well. Yeah. So it's now going around in the population that hasn't been vaccinated, but that puts people at risk. So you need to, as much as possible, if you can, if you're in the group that can get vaccinated, please do. Um, someone's asked here about the, and uh, thank you, Annabelle, for your question. Um, asking about um, trusted sources of, of information. And the other question she had um, is that the vaccines are being rolled out quite quickly. 
and a bit worried about the ethics of this and the science of herd immunity. Now, I don't think that the herd immunity strategy is the one that's being pursued. The, the strategy is to get as many people as possible vaccinated. But can you perhaps answer Annabelle's questions about um, how quickly the vaccines are being rolled out? Well, is that what, the danger of fraud with uh, uh, rolling out the vaccines? Is that what the question is? Because I couldn't quite catch oh, so the question, the question is from Annabelle is that there's questions about how quickly vaccines come out and... Ah, um, okay. So, yeah. so you mean uh, it's a shame? And governments are, are, are rolling out vaccines to minors. They're worried right. about well, the ethics of this. So we haven't done it in minors yet in this country. Yeah. Um, but Annabelle, you might know that lots of children are now getting it. And although it's been proven to be safe in children, there's still some children who are admitted with quite um, negative effects of um, COVID. Yeah, and, and that's, that's the bottom line, because when they were doing the trials, uh, the under 18s weren't involved. And so it'd be really unethical and even you know in, insane to actually go and uh, inject or maybe uh, give a vaccine that has not been cleared or been not been tried on the under 18s. But now the research is going on for the under 18s and very soon the data will come out and I'm hoping that they will give the green light. In America, green light has been given already. They've got the green tick and they are doing it already between the 12 and 15 year olds. Uh, but as I say, um, perhaps it's a situation whereby you have the children not being so infectious, put it that way, but then we wouldn't know that because the children aren't being tested. However, they have their own aspect of it. And I think Ngozi is better placed to actually talk about this Kawasaki syndrome, which is more to do with the children, but that's the extreme bit. So as, as things stand, I think the, the, the question is maybe uh, related to the fact that the rapidity of the development of the vaccine, if I'm not wrong, I think that's it. Now, uh, when you have a situation whereby you have sequential and parallel, I don't know if I'm making any sense. You have sequential and you have parallel. Now, the way they, they, they conduct, I have a slide in my other talk, the way they conduct the, um, the, 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 the trials or the research is that you have the preclinical stage where you have the animals, you know, they, they try them in the animals and then based on what the results are from the animals, they then move on to the human beings and then it starts from there. So sometimes it may last every stage, there's three clinical phases they have. So the first one might last two, three years, then move on to the second one, the equal period of time and the third one. So you're looking at nine, 10 years, that's when you have uh, what you call the red tapes, the bureaucracy, you have the funding drying up, you have the ethical committees and all that, all of that will take some time. But you did not have that in this COVID um, times that we're dealing with. Because otherwise, as I say, 55 million people died in 1918, and therefore the world knew that it would be brought to its knees, and so we needed to do something. So what they did was what we call genomic sequencing. They found the, 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 the particular uh, gene or whatever it is of the virus, and from there you can then try and get uh, and develop a vaccine against it. Now, some people might say, well, HIV has not got a vaccine and all that. Uh, how many years, 30, 40 years down the line? Well, I tell you what, when we had the outbreak of the Ebola virus in West Africa, where about 11,000 people died or lost their lives, in that two year period, there were actually two vaccines that were developed. Not many people know about that. So that every time or any other time, there is possibly an outbreak of such magnitude in West Africa or anywhere, the world is a, a, lot, re a lot more prepared, a lot better prepared to actually, you know, uh, combat or maybe try and, uh, um, you know, uh, get to deal with this uh, virus. And that's what happened. So as it is, there was a lot of money that was pumped into this. They removed the bureaucracy, they removed the red tape, and they were working in tandem. So everybody was co collaborating with each other. In order to get this. And that is why we actually ended up with the vaccine uh, at record time of 12 to 18. So it's nothing there. There's no Bill Gates uh, uh, a theory of chips uh, being put and all that, of magnets being put into people and all that, of affecting a fertility and all that. Nothing. There's no truth in the matter and there's no evidence to suggest that. But the world knew that this is a pandemic of absolutely, you know, uh, incalculable magnitude and therefore we need to act fast. And for us to do that, 
we need to get our wits together. That is why they removed all of that. Just for the Pfizer alone, there was 14 million pounds, 40 million pounds that was pumped into that. So as you know, that generated a lot of action and that is why this is where we are. So there was nothing there, you know, hidden or concealed in order to trick people. But this is how it was. Research would last sometimes 10, 15 years, but this one needed to be done as soon as possible. And that's why all the red tape was removed and the money was pumped into it. And that's why we have it in record time. Thank you. And, and lastly, Annabelle, I've, I've, seen, I've seen your question as well. That's just, you, you've got another question about um, forcing lots of people to get vaccinated. So I think what's important is for people to be provided with um, appropriate and correct information to allow people to make their own choices. So at the moment, nobody's being forced. Um, you've also said that you understand that COVID is a very serious illness, um, but you're worried about human rights. And again, nobody's being forced to get the vaccine. And also as a Christian, you find it a, a, a moral dilemma. And I can understand because I've spoken to many Christians. And the fact is that these are solutions that have been given to people, I feel, as a gift from God. And in a few weeks time, I've got a doctor who's going to come and speak to us about the, the dilemmas that you face as Christians with some medical interventions. And I think that's going to be a really interesting talk because there is sometimes dichotomy about faith and treatment. But I always come back to who gave us this knowledge? Who put this in place so that we could use our knowledge to help? I think these are gifts from God. And as medics, what we're seeing now is that even though the cases are still uh, are going up and there are lots of them, that what we practically see is that there are less deaths and there are also less people coming to hospital being treated with that laryngoscope, laryngoscope that Dr. Kamara showed us at the beginning of his talk. So the vaccines are having a direct impact now because the amount of morbidity and illness is going down as a direct result of the vaccine. And that has to be good. That has to be good. So we're going to end there. Um, we, I think it's been a really in, instructive talk today because you know it's been more than a year now that we've been living with COVID, but I think it's important to remind people of the symptoms and encourage people to get vaccinated and also encourage people um, who are perhaps suffering from the effects of long COVID. Thank you so much, um, Andrea, for sharing your story for, with us today. Um, yeah, I, I think- must, I must echo that you. sentiment, yeah. You don't have that many people uh, that are brave enough to front the camera and at least share them, you know, the experience and what they've been through. And of course, it, as I say, it's a powerful message that someone who's been through it to actually share that experience and say, look, I tell you what, count yourself lucky that you haven't actually contracted it. Me, I've had it and I am still struggling. And as I said, she said it all. I used to be a workaholic. Uh, that tells you something. Now she can hardly get herself to get to what she wants to do. That is powerful. Remember, nobody can come from up there. God cannot come down and talk to you. It's your human being that can talk to you. And we are privileged, we are lucky to have actually had the opportunity to be able to talk to you and maybe God has given us that possibility, that knowledge to come and share that with you. But please, please, please remember, do not look a gift horse in the mouth. You will probably regret it because if you can be protected against one variant, remember there are 13 variants and maybe counting. Yeah. So if you're lucky against one, you might not be lucky against the, the other 12. And the important thing is you might just be that unlucky person to contract that bit that you say, oh, for God's sake, if I knew but don't get to that boat, regret boat. You have the chance now. Take it when you're actually invited. You will only be thankful that you had that opportunity. Not many people have it. So remember, health we know is wealth. Believe you me, you can be as rich as anything, but if you do not have health, there's no chance you will actually be surviving to enjoy your wealth. So therefore, remember, we are the worst affected people. So therefore, we need to be at the head of the queue yeah, queuing right there at the front to get this thing started, sorted out. Stop, you know, listening to all these, you know, anti-vaxxers, they're not helpful. And if you are actually in receipt of any of these messages, please, please, please think twice. 
Think about it, look into it, Google it or research it before you can forward it on to anybody because that is the way we can stop this. And of course, take that opportunity when it comes knocking, go for the job. Thank you very much. Thank you. So for this month, thank you, Dr. Kamara, that was really helpful. So for the month of June, we have some really interesting talks lined up. So next week, we're going to have a talk on diabetes and its link to kidney disease. by a specialist renal physician, Dr. Areko Sima. The week after the 19th, we're going to talk about mental health again, because that's been for everybody, I think. We've had times when we really, really felt quite low during this COVID pandemic. So there's Dr. Joseph Amofuma, who many of you might know is a GP in Greater Manchester. He's going to talk about mental health, um, the silent affliction. And the week after to end the month, we'll have Dr. Vanessa Appiah back. Um, and she's going to talk about fertility, contraception and COVID-19 vaccines, because that's another area that I think concerns, especially young women, about the effect of the vaccine on their fertility. So I'm looking forward to all these sessions in June and you have a nice day. I'm just going to hand you over to Charles to see if he has any final words, but um, that's it from me and have a nice afternoon. The weather's beautiful. Thanks Ngozi. And yeah, once again, thanks to Dr. Kamara for coming along. You know, we've been calling you at short notice and you always do respond, but also what happens, you know, in addition to the health are, are smaller events that we have our medical professionals who do go along and, and have those intimate conversations and people can, you know, have the, the reassurance they need, but also answers to their questions. So Ngozi has gone through what we have planned. I think, you know, Tuesday we're back in with our healthy hearts, you know, physical activity and nutrition. And it will be good to see as many of you as possible because all, you know, every time our consultants have been talking about the food we eat and, you know, making sure we keep active as well as our vitamin D as a way of keeping the immunity levels up. So, you know, do take care of yourself. And just to, you know, remind all of us, the last Saturday of June after the health hour, you know, I think from one o'clock, we're going to have our Windrush Day celebration. It's a virtual event. So please book on and, you know, let's push, you know, and promote it to others and let's come along and celebrate, you know, our history. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful week and we will see you on Tuesday.